Hello everyone, and welcome to Soft Stories. I'm Stratton, and today we are going to be beginning a new book. Well, I say a new book, but this particular book is one of the oldest that I think we will ever read. This is Marcus Aurelius's private diary, now known as the Meditations. When this was first written by the Emperor Marcus Aurelius in the second century CE, somewhere in here are the exact dates of its writing, which I will try and find for you now. It was never intended to be read by another soul. This was his private diary, and it contains his meditations, notes on life and purpose, from someone who we now consider to be one of the great Stoic philosophers. I loved the meditations when I read it at school in philosophy class, and I continue to love it now, much like Epictetus's work that we read some time ago. It is of its time, but the wisdom that it speaks to, the stoic mindset that helps us to live within ourselves and within our means, and to not rely on external gratifications for our internal sense of self-worth, is valuable even today, even well outside of the context in which it was written. I am excited to share with you today these meditations. We will be beginning with book one. There are twelve in total, and we might just do a couple in succession before moving on to something else. But we will return, and fear not, for though this book is quite thick, the meditations themselves only take up 120 pages of it. The rest of this tome is full of extensive notes and introductions and references that are of great use to one who is reading it for the second or third time, but which we will gloss over for a purer reading of the text itself. And so, I think, we should begin, begin our reading of the text itself, as pure as we can make it. So let us start with the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, with Book One. From my grandfather, Virus, decency and mild temper. From what they say and I remember of my natural father, integrity and manliness. From my mother, piety, generosity, the avoidance of wrongdoing and even the thought of it, also simplicity of living, well clear of the habits of the rich. From my great-grandfather, not to have attended schools for the public, to have had good teachers at home, and to realise that this is the sort of thing on which one should spend lavishly. From my tutor, 
not to become a green or blue supporter at the races, or side with the lights or heavies in the amphitheatre, to tolerate pain and feel few needs, to work with my own hands and mind my own business, be deaf to malicious gossip. From Diognetus, to avoid empty enthusiasms, to disbelieve all that is talked by miracle mongers and quacks about incantations, exorcism of demons, and the like. Not to hold quail fights or be excited by such sports. To tolerate plain speaking. To have an affinity for philosophy, and to attend the lectures first of Bacchius, then of Tandasus and Marcianus, to write essays from a young age, to love the camp bed, the hide blanket, and all else involved in the Greek training. From Rusticus, to grasp the idea of wanting correction and treatment for my character, not to be diverted into a taste for rhetoric, so not writing up my own speculations, delivering my own little moral sermons, or presenting a glorified picture of the ascetic or the philanthropist. To keep clear of speechifying, versifying, and pretentious language. Not to walk around at home in ceremonial dress, or do anything else like that to write letters in an unaffected style, like his own letter, written to my mother, from Sunuesa. To be readily recalled to conciliation with those who have taken or given offence, just as soon as they themselves are willing to turn back. To read carefully not satisfied with my own superficial thoughts, or quick to accept the facile views of others, to have encountered the discourses of Epictetus, to which he introduced me with his own copy. From Apollonius, moral freedom, the certainty to ignore the dice of fortune and have no other perspective, even for a moment, than that of reason alone. To be always the same man, unchanged in sudden pain, in the loss of a child, in lingering sickness, to see clearly in his living example that a man can combine intensity and relaxation not to be impatient in explanation, the observance of a man who clearly regarded as the least of his gifts, his experience and skill in communicating his philosophical insights, the lesson of how to take apparent favours from one's friends, neither compromised by them nor insensitive in their rejection. from Sextus, a kindly disposition, and the pattern of a household governed by the pater familias, the concept of life lived according to nature, an unaffected dignity, intuitive concern for his friends, tolerance both of ordinary people and of the emptily opinionated an agreeable manner with all, so that the pleasure of his conversation was greater than any flattery, and his very presence brought him the highest respect from all the company. Certainty of grasp and method in the discovery and organisation of the essential principles of life, 
never to give the impression of anger or any other passion, but to combine complete freedom from passion with the greatest human affection, to praise without fanfare, and to wear great learning lightly. From Alexander, the grammarian, not to leap on mistakes or captiously interrupt when anyone makes an error of vocabulary, syntax, or pronunciation, but neatly to introduce the correct form of that particular expression by way of answer, confirmation, or discussion of the matter itself rather than its phrasing, or by some other such felicitous prompting. From Fronto to understand the effect of suspicion, caprice, and hypocrisy in the exercise of absolute rule, and that, for the most part, these people we call patricians are somewhat short of human affection. From Alexander the Platonist, rarely and never without essential cause, to say or write to any one that I am too busy, nor to use a similar excuse, advancing pressure of circumstances, in constant avoidance, of the proprieties inherent in our relations to our fellows and contemporaries. From Catullus, not to spurn a friend's criticism, even if it may be an unreasonable complaint, but to try to restore his usual feelings, to speak of one's teachers with whole-hearted gratitude, as is recorded of the Domitius and Athenodius, and a genu genuine love for children. From Severus, love of family, love of truth, love of justice. To have come by his help to understand Thracia, Helvidius, Cato, Dio, Brutus. To have conceived the idea of a balanced constitution, a commonwealth based on equality and freedom of speech, and of a monarchy which values above all the liberty of the subject. From him, too, a constant and vigorous respect for philosophy, beneficence, unstinting generosity, optimism, his confidence in the affection of his friends, his frankness with those who met with his censure, and open likes and dislikes, so that his friends did not need to guess his wishes. From Maximus, self-mastery, immune to any passing whim, good cheer in all circumstances, including illness, a nice balance of character, both gentle and dignified, an uncomplaining energy for what needs to be done, the trust he inspired in everyone that he meant what he said and was well-intentioned in all that he did. Proof against surprise or panic. In nothing either hurried or hesitant, never short of resource, never downcast or cringing, or, on the other hand, angry or suspicious. Generosity in good works, and a forgiving and truthful nature. The impression he gave of undeviating restitude, as a path chosen rather than enforced. The fact that no one would ever have thought himself belittled by him, or presumed to consider himself superior to him, and a pleasant humour. 
from my adoptive father, gentleness, and an immovable adherence to decisions made after full consideration, no vain taste for so-called honours, stamina and perseverance, a ready ear for any one with any proposal for the common good, to reward impartially, giving every one their due. Experience of where to tighten, where to relax. Putting a stop to homosexual love of young men, a common courtesy, excusing his court from constant attendance at dinner with him and the obligation to accompany him out of town, and those kept away by some other commitment, always found him no different towards them. Focused and persistent in deliberation in council, never satisfied with first impressions and leaving a question prematurely. The concern to keep his friends, with no extremes of surfeit or favouritism, his own master in all things, and serene with it. Foresight for the longer issues and unfussy control of the least detail, the check he put in his reign on acclamations and all forms of flattery. His constant watch on the needs of the empire, his stewardship of its resources, and his tolerance of some people's criticism in this area. No superstitious fear of the gods, nor with men any populism or obsequious courting of the mob, but a sober steadfastness in all things, and nowhere any vulgar or newfangled taste. In those things which conduce to the comfort of life, and here fortune gave him plenty, to enjoy them without pride or apology either, so no routine acceptance of their presence or regret in their absence. The fact that no one would ever describe him as a fraud or an impostor or a pedant, but rather as a man of mellow wisdom and mature experience, beyond flattery, able to take charge of his own and others' affairs. Further, his high regard for genuine philosophers. For the other sort he had no hard words, but easily saw through them. Sociability, too, and a sense of humour, not taken to excess. Sensible care of his own body, neither vain nor valuedinarian. But not neglectful, either so that his own attention to himself left very little need for doctors, doses, or applications. Most importantly, his readiness to defer ungrudgingly to those with some special ability. It might be in literary expression, or the study of laws or customs, or any other subject, and to give them his own active support to reach acknowledged eminence in their own specialities. Acting always in accordance with tradition, yet not making the preservation of tradition an overt aim. Further, no liking for change and chance, but a settled habit in the same places and the same practices, to resume instantly after attacks of migraine, fresh again and vigorous for his usual work. Not to keep many matters secret to himself, only a very few exceptional cases, and those solely of state concern. Sense and moderation in such things as the provision of shows, contracting of public works, doles and distributions, the acts of a man with an eye for precisely what needs to be done, 
not the glory of its doing. He was not one to bathe at all hours. He had no urge to build houses. He was not particular about food, the material and colour of his clothes, or youthful beauty in his slaves. The fact that his dress came from Lorium, sent up from his country house there, the many details of his way of life at Luvulium, Lanuvium, how he handled the apologetic customs officer in Tusculum, and all such modes of behaviour. Nothing about him was harsh, relentless, or impetuous, and you would never say of him that he broke out in a sweat, but everything was allotted its own time and thought, as by a man of leisure. His way was unhurried, organised, vigorous, consistent in all. What is recorded of Socrates would apply to him too, that he could regulate abstinence and enjoyment where many people are too weak-willed to abstain or enjoy too indulgently. Strength of character and endurance or sobriety, as the case may be, signifies the man of full and indomitable spirit, as was shown by Maximus in his illness. From the gods. To have had good grandparents, good parents, a good sister, good teachers, good family, relatives and friends, almost everything, and that I did not blunder into offending any of them, even though I had the sort of disposition which might indeed have resulted in some such offence, given the occasion. It was the grace of the gods that no set of circumstances likely to show me up ever arose. That I was not brought up any longer than I was with my grandfather's mistress, and that I kept my innocence, leaving sexual experience to the proper time, and, indeed, somewhat beyond it. That I came under a ruler and a father who was to strip me of all conceit and bring me to realise that it is possible to live in a palace without feeling the need for bodyguards or fancy uniforms, candelabra, statues, or the other trappings of such like pomp, but that one can reduce oneself very close to the station of a private citizen, and not, thereby, lose any dignity or vigour in the conduct of a ruler's responsibility for the common good. That I was blessed with a brother whose character could spur me to care for myself, and whose respect and affection were likewise a source of joy to me that my children were not born short of intelligence or physically deformed, that I did not make further progress in rhetoric, poetry, and the other pursuits in which I could well have been absorbed if I had felt this my right path, that I was quick to raise my tutors to the public office which I thought they desired, and did not put them off in view of their youth, with promises for the future that I came to know Apollonius, Rusticus, Maximus, that I acquired a clear and constant picture of what is meant by the life according to nature, so that with regard to the gods, their communications from that world, their help and their inspiration, nothing now prevents me living the life of nature my falling somewhat short, still, is due to my own fault and my failure to observe the promptings, not to say the instructions, of the gods. That my body has held out so far in a life such as mine, that I never touched Benedicta 
or Theodius, and that later experience of sexual passion left me cured, that though I was often angry with Rusticus, my behaviour never went to the point of regret, that my mother, fated to die young, nevertheless lived her last years with me, that whenever I wanted to help someone in poverty or some other need, I was never told that there was no source of affordable money, and that I myself never fell into similar want of financial assistance from another. That my wife is as she is, so submissive, loving, and unaffected, and that I found no lack of suitable tutors for my children. That I was given help through dreams, especially how to avoid spitting blood and bounce of dizziness, and the response of the oracle at sight Aetia. Just as you use yourself. That, for all my philosophy, I did not fall in with any sophist, or devote my time to the analysis of literature or logic, or busy myself with cosmic speculation. All these things need the help of the gods, and fortune's favour. There is the end of the first book of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. I'm sure you heard, as I felt when I read, some things that were distasteful to our more modern, open and accepting sensibilities. It's one of the fascinating things about reading pieces of literature that are 1800 years old, that the times in which they lived made the writings themselves, the men and women themselves, the people who they are, and the works what they are. But I am one of those who believes that a work can exist which is more worthwhile than its most regrettable assumptions about sexuality or ability or gender norms. And I think we see, especially in ancient writings from Rome and Greece, and I'm sure from other parts of the world as well, though it is from those two cultures that I am most familiar. We see power dynamics, gender dynamics, and sexual dynamics, which are of their time, though that is a phrase which I know many people find distasteful. If you have any thoughts, about the use of such language in works such as these, I would love to hear them. I would love to discuss with you whether the merits of a philosophy that dictates openness, acceptance and understanding is lessened by the world in which it was written. I think by now you know my answer, but I would love to hear yours, so please let me know in the comments below, or through email, which you can find in the description to this video. Thank you so much for joining me for the first book of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. I look forward to continuing, and I hope you do as well. I also look forward to hearing from you, so please do let me know your thoughts. But until we meet next time, whether in the comments or in the next video, I wish you all the best, and goodbye.